we've taken some uh, studies from EMSA standards, from the US Coast Guard, uh, from previous experiences in the deployment of LNG elsewhere around the world, and have a report with the lessons learned and the gaps uh, turning to a proposal to the national authorities for uh, adopting new legislation and regulations. Infrastructure is another barrier, another challenge. Development of global hubs for LNG supply will be important to back the increasing demand in the next few years. Pyrius is expected to be transformed in a hub stock uh, port. It's going to be the first pilot case. Um, and of course, we're going to have some risk assessment, review of operations, and establishing safety in port. We are investigating at the moment. The big challenge is the simultaneous operations. How are we going to have the bunkering of ships with uh, simultaneous operations? Of course, vessels could not be left aside from the equation. Six vessels have to be reviewed at the gas readiness approval in principle. So technically, safety aspects are going to be reviewed and visibility of LNG barge conversion as well because we need uh, to look at the supply side inside the port. So the project is based upon three main axes. It fosters strong collaboration among the industry key players, ship owners, charters, ports, fuel suppliers. It develops the infrastructure and hubs for the supply of natural gas to support the increasing demand at a global scale and establishes a harmonized industry standards to address safety concerns in the deployment of LNG. So what are the next steps ahead until 2020? There are plans for construction of a pilot LNG vessel for Venice Port. This is going to be first vessel in the Mediterranean. Ten plus ships approval in principle, so the plans are going to be ready for a retrofit if the owners decide to go that route. Studies and risk assessment for safety features in five ports and shipyard preparedness in case retrofits take place. This is the last slide of my presentation, and um, if we would like to convey a message to you today, this would be the benefits that the project will deliver and uh, has promised to deliver. Uh, not only technically, but also from a social and economic uh, point of view. So under the benefits to society, we would have a significant reduction of emissions. This is, of course, as we said before, aligned with uh, the region's top priorities at the moment and uh, um, top priorities and strategies. Uh, it will foster competitive maritime environment. It will significantly contribute to a very competitive maritime sector as it's going to improve the transportation costs uh, and, uh, prevent, and will prevent the modal shift from shipping, so from sea to rail and road transportation. There is going to be a notable introduction and application of technological expertise to strengthen maritime and shipping sector. Uh, it's going to safeguard the industry and the countries through smooth harmonization with the standards and challenges ahead in terms of regulations. And of course, we expect some uh, synergies with small scale LNG and the shore energy sector. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the very interesting and comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, as uh, Ms. Kuvertari pointed out, there are some uh, uh, existing legislation in Europe, uh, the new sulfur directive, uh, the EEDI standards at IMO level, the MRB regulation at EU level, and uh, the MBMs. Unfortunately, MBMs are not under discussion uh, in the IMO. And we have to, of course, to check to what extent all this uh, legislation contributes uh, to the sustainability of uh, shipping. We have seen that, for example, the EDI standards are not very difficult uh, to achieve. And, uh, but in any case, we have 50,000 premature deaths in Europe every year from air pollution from shipping and we need to develop new technologies. Um, having said that, I would like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Dr. Alistair Craig, uh, Senior Lecturer at the University College of London, uh, to take the floor.
legislation and the uh, emissions regulations. We have to meet these, shipping has to meet these. Uh, the emission control areas are already in place, more are coming. And they're going to be coming to a coastline near you soon. As you can see, the Mediterranean is likely to be an emission control area. But not just open, open water, we're going to find that it's going to maybe even states or even towns are going to start imposing their own emissions regulations, or it happens in the US. But it's not just the emissions we're used to, things like black carbon is now being discussed at the IMO, at the uh, MEPC, so the emission regulations are going to tighten. But there's competition. If we're talking about ports, we're not in the open ocean, we are close to land. And uh, the impact of the land-based regulations could be seen to be starting to play uh, an impact on ships. If we look at the Marpole Annex 6 regulations for NOx, you can see that they're pretty tough. <coughs> and uh, particularly if you look at the, uh, the Tier 3, the NOx emissions for emission control areas. But if we look at what they are for uh, heavy, heavy lorries, heavy diesels, that's where the Euro 4 regulations were in October 2005. And that's where they were in October 2008. And this is where they are now. So the land-based regulations for lorries, heavy, heavy diesels, are considerably stricter than they are for marine diesels. So that's going to start raising a question, why can a diesel engine that's running in a port, which effectively many people would think is land, uh, can get away with uh, emissions which are, are worse than uh, what the the lorries servicing that ship have to, to meet. And people would also argue, well, the green diesels are much bigger, therefore they're pumping out more pollution than a single lorry. And so why are ports such a particular problem? Well, the main engines obviously aren't running, but the auxiliary diesels are running, and they are many times they're running off their design point. So they're not running most efficiently, they're possibly not also meeting all the requirements for their design point for the emissions. And if you're running at part load, maybe some of the abatement measures are not particularly effective. You also have a lot of ships in a concentrated area. And they're close to large centres of population, which just exacerbates the problem. Worse than that, many ports are closed by land in the inner bowl, if you go to somewhere like Genoa, maybe not quite so much Piraeus, but the, the local geography just helps to concentrate all this pollution. And it's next to land. Already raised that issue. The problem here is that land-based legislators are saying, why should this marine vehicle have uh, pollution that's greater than all the land-based vehicles? And it's visible. So all those people who are living in the port, all those legislators, all those policy makers can see these ships. And if they're running off the line point, they're more likely to produce in smoke. Uh, so you just also have that image problem as well. Just as an example, uh, from a slightly old paper now, we did a study on uh, diesel engines on marine vessels when they're in port. Uh, and that's the auxiliary engine load for a chemical tanker, loading cargo. You see they're running there at about 30-35%. And but when it's uh, unloading, it's running at about 60-65%. Different loading levels make it difficult to match the engines for one particular application. And in both cases, they're not running at their sort of best design point, around about 85%. So they're running at low load, more likely to reduce emissions, less efficient. So we need to do something about this, and at this point, this is my colleague, comes in and tells you some of the solutions. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so, if we are to uh, discuss about alternative measures to reduce emission reports, I have, uh, we have enlisted here some of them, like, for example, use of uh, specific fuel. We have already uh, seen a presentation about it, uh, LNG and so on. 
There is also another measure, of, for example, of uh, dealing with the optimal selection of dedicated port generators and so on. And of course, cold ironing, the one that uh, I'm going to move, say a few words more in the next slides. What is the main concept about cold ironing or alternative uh, so, uh, marine power, as it is also called? Uh, as soon as uh, the ship comes uh, close to the port, uh, not only the main propulsion engines are shut down, but also the auxiliary engines, the generator sets. Uh, this is, uh, let's say, an easy way to say that we zero down the ship emissions and also the noise produced. Where comes the energy? It is, uh, through, this comes from uh, the power interconnection through the mainland inland, from uh, the main inland grid. Um, based on the grounds that uh, this inland grid actually has its main uh, its, uh, electricity generated by more environmental friendly sources. So, I believe that one major question is, is it feasible, both from the technical and economical point of view, and what are the investments required, because I think that most people are pretty well aware, at least those sitting in the room, that this is a pretty costly solution, and we've got three key partners or key players playing, the ports, the ships, and the main inland grid. So to this end, uh, we, uh, we have also to consider that uh, the ship energy demands could vary from a few, uh, from a few hundred kilowatts up to a uh, few megawatts. So we have, as uh, Alistair hinted uh, just a few moments, ago that we have to cover and meet all the demands almost simultaneously. So it's a big challenge also for the main inland grid. That's why we have um, tried to introduce and work out a so-called win-win solution from all partners, as I'm going to express, uh, to describe later on. And the idea is to blend in two different technologies, two different uh, big-scale projects running in parallel. The one deals with uh, ele uh, extensive electrification, according to which uh, uh, all major or minor equipment on board tend to be electrified, and in this way all energy components can be controlled and managed and monitored uh, in a more, uh, let's say, efficient way. And also the so-called smart grid concepts, which is uh, deployed uh, in inland grid. I would like to focus on this second part uh, the smart grids, where uh, actually there are several characteristics uh, that I, uh, are enlisted in this slide. For example, they are mainly uh, dealing with uh, low carbon electricity generated from, let's say, uh, low power producers, low power sources. They have to be uh, controlled and uh, managed in a very efficient uh, management, uh, power management systems. To this end, we need also to uh, to have uh, also electric energy storage units and also uh, we have to deal with power converters but what is uh, an advantage of this provided that they are exploited in the proper way is that they can be used to smooth the power demands in the inland grids consider for example what is going to happen in a very hot summer uh, period uh, here in, uh, in Athens or in Piraeus and so on to this end, uh, I'm going to, to show you just an example of what uh, happens, especially in the U.S., about how to provoke, let's say, to, to attain this, uh, what is called peak power haircut, according to which uh, all these uh, excessive uh, load demands are uh, actually covered by uh, charging electric vehicles during off-peak hour intervals, like, for example, during the night. But in these cases, uh, we have uh, to face a, a challenge like, for example, that we have to uh, have a, a large supervisory system monitoring uh, all these uh, uh, minor consumers of uh, low power demands. Now, in this case, I've already uh, said uh, what is the problem, to have to cover uh, rather big power demands and almost simultaneous, simultaneously imports. So, the idea that is under development right now is that we have to introduce, like uh, 
uh, in the LNG case uh, presented in the previous, by the previous speaker. Uh, but uh, we have them to introduce the ports as energy hubs. In this case, they are going to sell uh, electricity. This is where actually their infrastructure, that, uh, their infrastructure has to be enriched, especially with energy storage units, if we are to meet the demands also of cruise ships. The energy storage uh, units can be charged during off-peak hours, like during the night, and considering that we are talking about bulk uh, power uh, quantities, uh, they can be controlled more easily. So an energy a key player uh, in the entire grid of uh, grid uh, is uh, the port. I believe that uh, most people uh, would like to ask the question if there are energy storage units of such capacity and if they are cost efficient. Well, I do have some answers that, for example, uh, the flow batteries, there are at least two different technologies that I'm aware of, uh, they have already been exploited, at, at least in uh, uh, wind farm plants and so on. And so this is the idea that we want uh, to express right now, that, provide, that we need first a unified environmental friendly energy policy, which extends the smart grid policy even to cold iron ships. And to this end, we need to, uh, we can say that it is the ports that actually solve the major role and uh, we make uh, the effort to minimize the role of the ships with uh, minimizing, let's say, the um, required uh, refurbishment and uh, retrofitting. Now, I would like to ask again, Alistair, uh, to go on with the funding opportunities. So you've heard about the, uh, the environment, you've heard about one of the solutions, the last part of our talk is perhaps how you can get some money to do this. The European community has uh, quite a few different funding opportunities. The first is for research and development funding, and the second is innovation funding. Research and development funding, funded through Horizon 2020, tends to be large consortia, very much research focused, with a collaboration between academia, industry, and end users. It tends not to fund hardware items, and you only get the funding after the start date. Uh, this is one area that may be coming up for the, the next call. The call will usually come out into sort of two-year batches, which will be on ports of the future. And particularly, it's looking at reduction of environmental impact of port activities, and that includes the infrastructural costs and uh, networks. So it's certainly something to have a look at. Perhaps some more interest here is innovation funding. We've already seen some examples of that in the first talk, which are those on the 10T. It's now called ENA, Innovation Networks Executive Agency. has some distinct differences from the uh, research and development funding in that it will pay for pilot activities uh, and you can get up to 85% of the eligible costs if under the cohesion fund allocation, and that includes Greece. It can include significant items of hardware, so that could in, that could be up to you know, three or four million euro out of a five or six million euro contract. Cannot include any research, and a big difference from uh, the R and D funding is that you can actually have started the project before you submit the proposal. So retrospective funding is possible, and it's much, it tends to be much smaller consortium. So this is very relevant to sort of ports looking to install or try new infrastructure, particularly things like LNG or uh, cold iron. I couldn't get away without uh, an advert for the Transport Research Arena Conference, which is funded by the European Commission next year. It would be an excellent opportunity for anybody who's interested in finding out more about EC funding or networking. And thank you all very much for your attention, and we'll be taking questions later, I think. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Alistair Craig, and thank you, Dr. John Brusselidis, uh, for your presentation. Uh, are there any questions on the presentation? Yes, sir. 
spread out any fear here. Uh, now we have all the hiring, we have electricity supply by port, without the finance department, one will charge VAT over the electricity. So on one hand, they get subsidies, on the other hand, they take the taxes. And it means that the competitor rate of port using fuel is not paying any VAT, and you, as a green operator in the port, you need to pay more than 20% VAT to fill any business tax. So then you couldn't take into account that you not only did cooperation on Brussels, but also on the rest of our countries. I think the short answer to that one is no. Uh, I think charging sort of taxes is very much a national national issue as opposed to uh, a European Commission issue. And I think different countries have different VAT rates. Uh, and I think if that was mandated by, by Brussels, you would see the UK leaving the European Union even faster than it might be. <laughs> but it, it is an issue, yes, exactly. You're saying one hand and the other hand. We could do some more joined up thinking about this because if you want to uh, encourage people to use green, I think there's basically two ways that you're going to do it. You either make it financially attractive or you use legislation. So you use the carrot or you use the stick. And it sounds like you've got a mixture of both there, which is not a very efficient way of doing things. Sorry, I could answer uh, to some extent. Uh, I, I'm not uh, sure if I can cover the whole uh, question. Uh, but the point is um, about the cost, if I could start from the, the end. Let's say about the cost, it depends on the ship type. If we are talking about uh, uh, rural ferries, for example, where, where, where while at birth they have uh, an energy demand of about, let's say, 100 kilowatts, and the minimum, and the, let's say the capacity, the nominal capacity of uh, their generators is about 500 kilowatts, it's definitely more costly from both emission and fuel point of view uh, to have uh, the engines running just to cover 10% or 20% uh, uh, of uh, their nominal loading capacity. So uh, I think it's, uh, there's another question about uh, par uh, the particles and the noise that is nearby the airport, as Alistair mentioned, uh, we are talking to the ports not only as, let's say, an industrial zone, but also as a zone where several people are making the cruise and so on. So uh, uh, there is a, a different quality of life when we do not have all these things, and I don't know if this is measurable. Now, coming to cruise ships, yes, the, the answer is more difficult, because there we need also um, a different technology. We need medium voltage to get there. The cost of getting medium voltage in underground cables nearby the sea and so on, it's almost ten times the other. 
So it is more costly. But uh, on the other hand, we are talking about uh, large uh, power demands, and that's why I mentioned the story of uh, identifying win-win solutions. And if I could also come back and say something like, it seems like a, a science fiction scenario, uh, I could even say that in certain cases, provided that LNG, for example, is exploited, passing to the first presentation, in certain cases, for example, during unloading natural gas, it is possible that there is an excess of oil off. This uh, excess of energy could be transformed easily by an LNG carrier uh, into electricity and could be sold back to the inland grid. So you have also, since uh, I'm provoked, let's say, to discuss further economical issues, uh, we could actually blend even alternative fuels like natural gas and uh, also uh, cold ironing as well. Uh, I think that uh, if I could also come to the first question, there is another issue about this uh, uh, delicate issue, the regulatory framework, as uh, Alistair mentioned. There is a regulatory framework about uh, electric vehicles, for example, who is going to sell, what are the stations, and so on. There is, we try also to make some regulatory framework about the smart grids, uh, about the small producers of electric energy. It's a different story, but we can have, let's say we can exploit the background that it is already there, and since uh, there are some policy makers here, or some decision makers or whatever, uh, here in the room, like for example officers from the European Commission, our recommendation is that we could blend in this know-how into a single, uh, a single story of reducing, let's say, emissions in uh, ports and the emission control areas using several alternative plans, not only one. Cold iron is not the only solution, I admit it. Uh, thank you. And uh, talking about uh, uh, regulation, there is a proposal now, there is an ongoing process on the revision of uh, uh, the National Emission Ceilings Directive, and there is a proposal of uh, some MEPs in the European Parliament to include uh, cold ironing uh, in the annexation of the directive. Having said that, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Ido Donkers, independent consultant to the Port of Ostend, and uh, sail project to take the floor. <coughs> Thank you, Sotinius. Good, uh, good morning, everyone. Kalimea. I'm uh, shifting from a holiday location to here, so I've made the transfer successfully. I wanted to react shortly on the discussion um, that when I worked on cold ironing, I did a study for the Euromax terminal in Rotterdam for larger container vessels where it appeared not a viable option, shore connected power. And I remember from that time that two guideline documents were in the making from the European Commission about shore connected power. And I remember that VAT and financial incentives were part of it. So I don't know if we're drowning in the pile of EU documents and haven't found it yet, and if the budget is focusing on it. But I know particularly that there are financial incentives from the European Union. I might be wrong, but I remember from that time. And there's a certain guideline about promoting uh, cold, uh, cold ironing. Um, that's not uh, my uh, subject. This morning, my subject uh, will be hybrid shipping. I'll explain the term of hybrid shipping soon to you. Um, this is me. I've uh, started my career in this direction at the North Sea Foundation. I worked at the Port of Rotterdam for a few years, and most of my working years I spent at the Pro Sea Foundation working on an IMO model course, Marine Awareness, and various ship owners. And although the, the show up here in, in quantity is, is quite low, my expectation level is quite high because I once attended a Lloyd's Register conference where the number of participants was to be 20 and was to be 5, and I ended up with three people in the room. And one of those people were actually, was actually from LSL Tankers, and I ended up working with him for three or four years after. So the quality of uh, participants uh, could be quite uh, quite high in that respect. Uh, I've worked 
more the Port of Ostend in the sail project, which is a European project focused at the further development of sails and hybrid shipping. Uh, but first, a little holistic um, a view. This is the, this Pond Bell, if I pronounce it well, the, the old Dutch vessel from the beginning of the previous century, and where were we as mankind, where we, we were just developing, burning massive uh, volumes of fossil fuel coals by then, later crude oil. It seems like uh, 5,000 years ago, but it's only 100. And this is actually um, a vessel that was operating well at the time, with, of course, very normal at the time for freight carriers sales, and there was a highly innovative fossil fuel engine at the back, but just to make sure we would arrive from A to Z, we put some sails on it just to be sure it would arrive. So where are we as mankind? The only constant thing in life is change, I think. We're changing back, because the technology I'm talking about is about reintroducing sails um, in the maritime industry, and what do we do? You might guess we put a fossil engine just to make sure it arrives from A to Z. So sometimes it's mankind we're shifting to and fro. What is hybrid shipping as defined in our EU sail project where I'm going to talk briefly about? It's alternative pro propulsion by combined wind power and engine. As you saw from my background, I'm, yes, I'm originating from the environmental sector, but also work at the board. And what I particularly like about this project that it doesn't say the whole world has to change to reintroduce sail ships. No. Let's see what we can do with sails under the current market and guarantee that the freight arrives in time. And what is the additional cost? And, of course, if the speed of transport would be less uh, important, or if you, in market language, could adjust your operational processes to transport, well, you can reduce a great deal, both in CO2 and other emissions. I'll get back to that. A short overview of the project, the business case, the core of my presentation will be the business case of the Ecoliner. We're in the stage of finalization, so it's currently being refined. And what conditions will make hybrid sh shipping set sail? That's a, that's a difficult one, a challenging one. Short history of hybrid shipping and the sail project. The sail project started three years ago. Um, and it, it's operating in the environment of an innovative uh, progress, which you can summarize that in the 70s there were various concepts uh, being developed, of course, as an aftermath of the, of the uh, oil crisis. And um, that includes flapper rotors, dyno rig applications, the Maltese Falcon, which has its home port, Pireus here, is a recreational and a, and a sailing race vessel, so not. Uh, not afraid yet, but we're, uh, we're just about to see that shift, I think. B9 shipping, also working with Dynaric, the Beluga Skysail, and increasing oil prices from recent times have made this Skysail set sail. And I'll tell you very briefly what I think what went terribly wrong with this uh, development. I think it was very useful that it was there, and it was being used by Beluga shipping, and all kinds of factors led to the downfall of, of the technology. So it's good that it was proven that, um, that it works. But I did courses, like I said, said, for the shipping industry, explaining that sky sales was the perfect solution for 30% emission reduction. And later I found out, well, 30% was actually a kind of an overestimation. And what's more, the wearing out of the materials was uh, quite worse than expected. So you had a development. I Try to educate the sector with many people. This is a good option. And I found out later that there, were, that there were things that were not included in the business case. And what I try to do today, today is prevent that and be realistic. Current reality is low oil prices, as low as you can think of. But hybrid shipping is still into view. The industry is looking at it. So I think from a personal, professional point of view, it's here to stay. What have we achieved? Well, of course, a lot of meetings across Europe and a lot of bureaucracy uh, surrounding European projects, which I think is still a bit frustrating. But if you look what we've actually done in the project, that's quite impressive. With EU citizens' tax money, we've uh, managed to uh, execute wind tunnel and towing tank tax. And we were able to answer an increasing number of questions from the market. 
And I'm very sorry to say that we just about managed to get an investor for a hybrid sailing vessel using the Dynaric uh, sail uh, application, but just about. Uh, it just didn't work out at this point in time. And I expect it will within one or two years. Valuable networks, dissemination, and fact sheets and the business case. I brought some fact sheets with me. They're in the pre-finalization stage, so uh, they all look, uh, look fine and shiny, but they are still being refined. But I have them with me, so I can uh, give you a copy. The business case is, of course, that emissions from shipping compared to other transport modes are rising. We can have discussions about at which rate, but they are rising. And also, when you look at CO2, if no measures are taken, we all know these figures, I guess. Uh, we are talking about uh, uh, doubling or tripling the emissions in a few decades. You can quite show where the shipping lines are with 70% of all shipping movements of 400 kilometers off a coast or near. We are talking about massive environmental effects. And we're still in this uh, time frame where in 2020, approximately, in terms of NOx and SOx, the shipping sector doesn't make a real sustainable picture that it wants to put in on itself. So there's work to be done, there's challenges, of course. What's the principle of the Ecoliner? The Ecoliner uses the Dynaric sail, which is a, I'm not a, uh, I'm a landlubber, I'm not an expert on the sail technology, but the Dutch firm Dijkstra and Partners, who have designed the Maltese Falcon and another uh, a bunch of good operating vessels have developed this technology. Further, the basic thing is that uh, it's a pity that the person from the European Parliament for Portugal is not uh, here anymore. The basic principle is that from the west coast of Europe, if you travel to the Caribbean or either Brazil, roughly, yeah, and you go to east coast US and you travel back, you can make a good business case, for sure. Prevailing winds, trade winds, it's the old trade winds routes. You can still use them with the advanced technology. Dijkstra Partners, uh, I don't have shares in the company, so there's no commercial connection. It's personal, professional uh, observation. They can uh, make a very smart uh, use of the wind work with an advanced weather program. And for particular uh, tonnages of vessels, it can be very attractive. There are other routes to develop. Uh, we won't finalize our studies uh, in the course of the project. It will end within a month of uh, the Aberdeen or even Norway uh, Ost End route, which is also promising. The Mediterranean, in terms of tonnage, could be interesting because I've been told there's a lot of grain dry bulk vessels trading here, which are all the tonnage and could be maybe replaced by, uh, by hybrid technologies. But in terms of winds, predictions doesn't work, it's still work to be done. Um, this is not really a retrofit solution, to explain to you briefly. This is really about building a new vessel and some more details about the, the particular uh, business case. What have we tried to do, and are managing, I think, <coughs> to make assumptions transparent, to not have nice stories, this could all work, and like the sky sales, find out later, it didn't work as well as we, uh, as we hoped. Compare a conventional burlker, I'll show you in a minute which size, with a hybrid ship Ecoliner, and combining various disciplines. I saw that I swatch also entering the room, the other one, sure he's in the middle of the room. Technology, business, and economy into one business case. And of course, cross validation of assumptions and calculations. Not an easy thing to do, but a challenging thing to do. These are the basic specifics of the Ecoliner. It hasn't been built yet. It's still a prototype on paper. Length, draft, it's all in the business case, so I won't go into much details. Suggested engine power is 3,000 kilowatts. It will sail uh, on this Atlantic Triangle, as you showed, uh, approximately three-fourths three of the time uh, as a motor sailor. So use of the engine smartly along with wind power. Replacement of the rigging in sales is approximately every five years. That's all being built into the business case. What are we talking about? We're talking about niche markets, and particularly ones, is my view, where you have products or have products that are consumer facing. This is really financial and bank language. But if you have an opportunity to market 
uh, your products, that would be beneficial. For example, in Amsterdam you have a lot of cacao trading, I think the biggest cacao port in the world. That's a particular project where you would have real marketing value to the consumers. The consumer does not know shipping. The consumer, we all, we work in the industry, but a lot of people don't know that 9 out of 10 products were in a fish ship. I think that message has to be brought across as well. And also that transport is actually a very valuable economical activity. And not just going from A to Z. It's a quality product, I think. You need an investor with a longer term CSR strategy. Because yes, it will involve some risk, some, some uh, validation of uh, parameters, although things look, look promising, and it will cost extra, especially for the first prototype. Dry liquid bulk are particularly markets among the markets you see here, which are very promising. And what ship operators always ask, and that's a very uh, good learning curve for me as an environmentalist, yes, they always ask, what's the escape strategy? What if after seven or eight years, we want to get rid of the sails and use it as a conventional vessel. Those scenarios also look promising. So that's all things you have to incorporate for a good business case. Um, the results is that, well, the in net present value and other costs um, is comparable, but of course, since 60% of the operational costs now could be higher with uh, raising oil prices, is fuel, you are talking about in the longer term you are looking at a cheaper vessel, but the beginning investments of the prototype, of course, will cost extra. I'll tell you how much. And what it costs extra, of course, has to do with uh, economic speed, the economic speed that is desired. When you, at this Atlantic Triangle, which we uh, had a close look at, when you motor sail and use the sails and the motor smartly, you are talking about, and I I dare to guarantee that when I look at the figures and many people with me, a 35% at least reduction of CO2. If you would reduce the economical speed further, we are talking about 50% plus reduction. And what I heard in the dry bulk market, that operational processes nowadays can be adjusted, so you would have a flexible arrival scheme. And what's very important in terms of uh, commercial picture, that it has the same arrival time. That's a little mistake in the slide here. I'm sorry for that. If you're talking about 35% reduction in motor sailing, you are talking about the same arrival time of your cargo. If you would have flexibility and could uh, arrive a day less, you're talking about bigger reductions. So you'll have flexibility to perform just as a conventional broker or make greater reductions when you decrease speed. These are all further details. I think I'm uh, overreaching my time, so I'll go more quickly. Um, you can find them in the business sheets I have with me. How to set sail? What will make uh, uh, this development set sail? Well, to be realistic, replacing the current small tonnage of boat vessels will not save the day in terms of air quality or even CO2 reductions. I think I've shown you. But there is market potential in certain niches. You have to find smartly where those niches are. And in my view, there's a social economic revolution needed, a redefinition of transport and quality transport. If you market this, you have to do it very smartly and show this as a kind of green beacon on what can be achieved in shipping in terms of emission reduction. And yes, there is a business case. We're not talking about uh, greeny stuff, we're talking about uh, dollars on the longer term. Peter, one the minute. minute. Yeah, I'm, I'm closing, closing up. The role of PPPs and ports, public-private partnerships, yes, I think ports should function as uh, an energy hub because the island I just came from, the island of Milos, does anyone know what this piece of stone is? The Greek lady, Anastasia, who knows the Greek, the black stone there, no? We are talking about black gold, crude oil. This is black gold from four or five thousand years ago. It's called obsidian. And on the island of Milos, uh, many say that the first commercial seaport ever of mankind was built. And I guess that were all sailing vessels or uh, with rowers. Uh, I won't have to boast about economic uh, uh, progress of uh, Holland uh, a few centuries back, but I think the European Union has an obligation to push this forward. Thank you.
transition. Yeah. I would suggest to go directly to the last presentation. We're, run, we're running out of time and have a 15 minute uh, discussion. Uh, Ms. Patricia Heidegger, Executive uh, Director at NGO Sea Breaking Platform. slightly shifting topic. Uh, we've been talking about uh, greening the life cycle of ships and uh, there's one uh, stage in the life cycle of ships, um, the end of life management of ships, which uh, has not been fully taken into the equation yet, unfortunately. Um, and um, probably as a preliminary um, comment before I, I, I go into the, the presentation, um, if there's one thing I would probably all, uh, like us uh, all to, to think about is that um, if you visit an event like this and you have a look at all the, uh, the innovations, all the ideas that are presented uh, to green the life cycle of ships to, to contribute to blue growth, um, I, would, I would also like us to have the same kind of ambitions uh, when we talk about ship recycling. Um, uh, we will see that uh, a lot is needed uh, to green this in uh, industry and uh, I would like us to believe that also ship recycling is something that can be done in a, in a, in a green and in a sustainable way and that it's not necessarily an industry which has to be polluting, which has to be damaging uh, to the environment and, and uh, to people. Um, so, ship recycling is a, is a very complex issue, uh, legally, financially, economically, etc. And uh, in a 15 minutes presentation, I will not have, uh, have the time to, to uh, give you a full picture of neither our work nor of the problem. And I will only be able to focus on a couple of issues that are uh, important for the European um, perspective on this. I will not be able to speak about discussions about uh, ship recycling, for example, in South Asia, in China, in Turkey, uh, in detail. So what uh, I will speak about is I will briefly introduce our organization. Uh, I will give you a short, short uh, um, overview of current ship breaking practices, mainly in South Asia, where most of uh, European uh, ships are currently uh, recycled. Um, I will talk about the, the role of your sh European ship owners, uh, why I think that um, talking about CSR, talking about the, the greening of the life cycle of ships. Uh, European ship owners who have probably started to take into consideration other aspects that we have heard about, such as uh, emission control, for example, uh, can do much more to integrate um, the full life cycle management of the ships, including the end-of-life management, uh, into their CSR practices. This is something that is starting, that has started, but um, where there's a lot of more potential for ship owners to integrate this into their, um, uh, their strategy. Uh, I will briefly come to the new European uh, regulation on uh, ship recycling, uh, which we think has a potential to uh, push the debate forward, uh, to create new standards and also to kind of uh, wake up uh, the maritime industry and to um, encourage uh, ship owners and other stakeholders from the maritime industry to, to integrate uh, sustainable ship recycling into their um, practices. Um, there is also an ongoing debate about um, a possible financial mechanism at the European Union level to uh, encourage or incentivize uh, clean and safe ship recycling. I will say a few words uh, about that. And my last slide will be about um, the question whether ship recycling is also an attractive possible activity uh, for European companies. And there are uh, ship recyclers active in Europe and uh, there are um, companies interested all around uh, the European uh, coasts uh, to get more involved into this industry and I think it's a potential that uh, the European Union should also uh, take into consideration more. Uh, so who are we? We are a global coalition of 19 NGOs. Uh, our members are based both in countries which own ships and uh, our members are based in countries that recycle most of the ships currently, which is mainly uh, India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Um, we have um, a common objective, 
which is to promote uh, clean and safe ship recycling and to um, uh, prevent dirty and dangerous shipwrecking practices. Uh, what have we achieved so far? Um, we have managed to uh, put the issue of ship recycling on the international agenda um, of the European Union's agenda, um, of the agenda of different UN bodies. Um, we have different uh, international, international legislation in place. Uh, we had milestone decisions in courts, both in the EU, also in, in South Asian courts. Um, there's also new domestic regulations in place on ship recycling in different ship recycling countries. Uh, we have been able to raise a lot of awareness about this issue in uh, leading global media. We have created some transparency about shipwrecking practices uh, of ship owners in different areas uh, of the world. And uh, this has eventually led to um, uh, a larger number of uh, progressive ship owners who are now choosing alternatives, um, who choose clean and safe ship recycling. So what are the current uh, practices? All this information is based on research that uh, we've been doing in the last, uh, we've been doing this research for many years, but um, what I'm telling you now is uh, things that we've been researching in the last uh, two years, uh, also during visits in all the ship recycling, major ship recycling countries uh, in the world. Uh, so the large amount of ships currently is recycled uh, in South Asia, as I said before, in India, Bangladesh and Pakistan. China is a major ship recycling country, Turkey. Uh, but also uh, ship recyclers in the European Union have taken a share of, um, um, well, a rather small share, um, for example, these are the figures for the first quarter, 2015. Um, so at the moment we do see a, um, a record number every year of ships that have to be recycled. Um, this has various reasons, economic reasons, um, but of course one reason is also that whenever there's um, technological um, developments, when there's strict environmental regulations. Uh, this is also one reason why ship ha ships have to be uh, recycled. Uh, and this is also, of course, where our issue uh, relates to what we have heard before. Uh, so we have to make sure that whenever um, ships have to be dismantled uh, because of uh, strict environmental legislation, we have to make sure that the, the ships are actually recycled in a proper way, so that we do not provide a solution on the one hand and on the other hand more problems. A good example, I think, is the phasing out of single oil, tank oil tankers, which initially, of course, was a European uh, initiative, and which, um, um, yeah, but which led to the fact that a lot of oil tankers had to be uh, scrapped, and most of them ended up in definitely not adequate facilities uh, on beaches in, in South Asia, contributing to pollution and, uh, and negative health effects there. So um, this is the kind of uh, um, policies, of course, that, that we have to uh, avoid in the future and to make sure that uh, the phasing out of certain technologies does not create further problems elsewhere. Um, so, as I said before, two-thirds of the end-of-life vessels currently uh, go to substandard facilities. Um, there is still a legal grey zone. Um, we have an international convention on ship recycling, which is not in force. Uh, we have a European regulation, which is not applicable. We have different uh, international waste laws, European waste law, uh, which, is European, which is usually circumvented, um, and we have domestic laws in ship recycling countries which are not enforced. Um, the majority of the ship owners uh, all around the world uh, do not yet feel responsible for this issue, so ship owners um, mostly believe that ship recycling has nothing to do with the operational life of their ships. So they don't, they don't have to be responsible for uh, the proper recycling all the way to, to the end. However, there's um, uh, a number of uh, ship-owning companies who have changed their mind, um, who believe that uh, proper end-of-life management is part of their responsibility, and who show by their practices that proper recycling of vessels is actually possible. Um, so now coming to, um, to the current uh, practices, unfortunately, um, talking about the greening of the uh, uh, life cycle of ships, um, ship recycling in most cases is still related to pollution, uh, to very poor working conditions. Uh, our organization uh, documents accidents uh, in ship breaking and we do not really see a, a drop in accidents, neither in five fatal accidents nor in other severe accidents. Uh, there is still uh, hazardous child labor involved uh, in shipbreaking. 
uh, in particular in Bangladesh, although this is illegal under Bangladesh domestic uh, law. There's a very high uh, risk of can cancer and other occupational diseases uh, in these occupations. Um, and of course, there's also a loss of other local, local livelihoods, for example, fishing. Um, and we have seen the destruction of uh, forests, which were planted by European Union money uh, to protect the coasts. Uh, they were raised in order to create space for uh, these facilities. Um, I have a couple of pictures. I'm not going to comment on, on much. Uh, lack of uh, protection uh, equipment. Um, this is a current picture from uh, hazardous waste management in Pakistan. This is asbestos, which is obviously not properly landfill. Asbestos from end of life. Uh, housing for workers uh, in shipbreaking in Pakistan. Um, this is uh, shipbreaking uh, in Bangladesh, where you can see that um, uh, the ships are very far out in the intertidal zone, which makes it impossible to use any kind of uh, um, machinery, uh, which also makes it impossible for the men to wear boots, for example, because they have to uh, work in the, in the mud. Uh, it's also impossible for emergency response to come to the vessels in case of accidents. We have been working with uh, child workers in Bangladesh, like this boy who's 15, who was uh, injured last year, who did not get medical treatment because uh, employing children is illegal in ship recycling, so um, of course nobody wants to be responsible if some of the kids get uh, injured. Uh, this is workers' accommodation in Alang and ship breaking yards in India. Um, this is a rescue operation after a big accident on a British oil tanker in Alang, and you can see that, of course, uh, no ambulance and no um, adequate emergency response can approach the vessel. There's not even a gangway to um, bring injured people um, back uh, on the beach. This is waste burning uh, in Alang, which is illegal under Indian law, of course. And this is a recent satellite image from Google Earth uh, taken in 2015, which shows the oil spills in Alang in India um, in the ship recycling. So, uh, what is the role of the European ship owners? Um, as I said before, we believe that uh, there's a lot of potential for European uh, ship owners to integrate ship recycling into uh, their CSR um, and uh, to make deliberate choices to choose proper ship recycling facilities. On the slide, you can see uh, on the left hand side a picture of uh, unsustainable ship recycling. On the right hand side, you can see a modern ship recycling facility which could be anywhere in the world. This one is in, in Northern Ireland, and it's a deliberate choice a ship owner can make to have a ship recycled in such a uh, modern ship recycling um, facility. Um, I'm just going to say uh, one sentence about the, the figures. So, I mean, we all know the share uh, of um, ships European ship owners control. Um, so, the European Union is the single largest market for end of life ships and it's one of the major contributors to dirty and dangerous shipwrecking practices in other parts of the world. This is why we believe that especially the European Union has a particular responsibility also as a legislature to make sure um, that we do find solutions. Um, every year we, we publish uh, data on uh, the number of vessels that have to be uh, dismantled and uh, we have exact data about uh, where the ships come from, so who were the, the, the previous owners, and what kind of vessel was it, the year of build, uh, and finally when and where the ship was, was dismantled. So this is a couple of uh, European and um, East Asian companies that um, were the top dumpers in 2014 when it comes to the number of end of life vessels they have sold to substandard facilities. Uh, these lists are usually um, uh, led by Greek and German ship owners when we look at uh, the European side of um, the problem. Um, so what do, we, um, what do we recommend ship owners to do? Here's a list of uh, some of the ship owners that I've mentioned who already um, take care of clean and safe uh, recycling and who show that um, it's, it's absolutely possible to integrate um, the uh, proper end-of-life management into your, your uh, company strategy. Um, we directly engage with ship owners who um, have an interest in, in changing their, their practices. And um, the first thing that we advise them to do is to um, not just to sell an end-of-life vessel to somebody uh, who, uh, well, they will not fully know where, this, where the, the ship will be going and they will lose control of the end-of-life management but to um, directly engage with ship recycling companies. This is what these companies, for example, do. 
Um, they have uh, direct contracts with uh, ship recycling yards. Um, they do monitoring of the recycling process, so they maintain the control about uh, the recycling process. And there's many other things that ship owners can do, and uh, we're very willing to share um, all our ideas with, with ship owners who uh, get in touch with us. Now coming to the European uh, Ship Recycling Regulation, which has been the result of a year-long debate on the European Union level of how to, to uh, address the problem. I have mentioned that there is also an international regulation um, which uh, is not in force, so this is also one reason why uh, European policymakers felt that um, the European Union has to, um, has to go forward and has uh, to uh, regulate uh, on the issue. Um, the new regulation will become applicable at some point between 2016 and 2019. Um, and uh, the main um, part of it, I mean, there's a lot of uh, interesting details, but uh, what it basically means is that um, end-of-life vessels which uh, still fly the flag of a European member state will be legally obliged uh, to be recycled in a ship recycling facility which the European Commission has deemed to be um, in accordance with uh, community standards. Um, these facilities can be anywhere in the world. Um, so um, we hope that on the, not on the short uh, run, but on a, on a let's say, midterm perspective, uh, this will also lead to, um, I mean globally, this will uh, hopefully lead to uh, a development where standards for ship recycling are, are raised um, and where more and more ship owners will um, um, follow the standard um, beyond the legal obligation. Um, so looking at the requirements of the ship recycling um, facility, I'm not, I'm not going to go into the, the detail of uh, the text. Um, however, um, we do believe uh, that, the, that the, this uh, regulation uh, has a potential to, um, yeah, to, to influence um, ship recycling practices um, elsewhere in the world. Even probably some of the facilities or facilities in some areas of the world are currently not able to, um, to adhere to the European standard. Um, we uh, hope that um, also if the, the, the whole maritime industry, the shipping, uh, the, the ship owners, um, show um, more interest in having their ships recycled in a clean and safe way, if they create uh, a stronger demand, if they create a market for clean and safe ship recycling, that this will also eventually lead to more improvements, uh, for example, in the ship recycling yards in, in South Asia. This doesn't mean that we do not also need other um, incentives, um, for example, um, and support also from, um, for example, the European Union or other um, international stakeholders to assist uh, the ship recycling countries um, in other parts of the world to improve uh, the standard. So now I'm um, just coming to my last uh, two slides, um, about two uh, further uh, discussions that are going on at the moment. Uh, I mentioned that there's a debate about a possible financial mechanism uh, which could be introduced by the European Union to uh, incentivize clean and safe ship recycling. There's a lot of uh, different models which are being discussed. Um, and uh, yeah, we are waiting for uh, an impact assessment which has been commissioned um, by the EC on different uh, possible models. Um, our message at the moment is that we would like stakeholders to remain open to this debate. It's not a very easy debate. It's very complex from an economic and a financial point of view to um, yeah, incentivize uh, clean and safe ship recycling with, with such a mechanism. But we would just like to invite everyone to uh, discuss, to openly discuss, and to see if we can find instruments um, to, um, yeah, to, to incentivize this, which goes beyond uh, only legal obligations for uh, European flagged ships, which obviously will not cover a very large amount um, of ships. And now um, the last uh, thought, um, we're here to talk about uh, blue growth uh, in the European Union, we're talking about uh, yeah, greening uh, the life cycle of ships, so it's not known to a lot of people that there is ship recycling going on also within the European Union. Um, we have active ship recyclers for example in the UK, in Denmark, in Belgium, in France, in Spain and in Italy. Um, there's a potential in many more countries. We are in touch with a lot of different industry stakeholders, um, for example, from Poland, Lithuania, Greece, and other countries who are interested in getting more involved in ship recycling. 
Um, at the moment, these um, facilities recycle small vessels and government-owned vessels, but we do believe that there's also potential to cooperate with, uh, with ship owners to even enter joint ventures um, to um, strengthen this industry to, um, and also to, um, yeah, to ensure that um, these companies can invest in, in proper infrastructures. Probably we can also have the, we have, have the opportunity to discuss this a little bit with the ship recyclers who, who are present today. Uh, and we do believe that uh, this could also lead to, lead to job creation in port areas, but there's also services connected um, to ship recycling. Uh, there's a lot of expertise needed, there's uh, research and development needed, so there's potential also in Europe to create um, growth, blue growth uh, around um, ship recycling. So I'm looking forward to the discussion and I thank you for your attention.